Hello and welcome to Fire in the Belly. Today we have myself, Mighty Pete, and we have the Christian De La Huerta. Have I got that right for your name? You did it beautifully. Thank you. Thank you. Listen, welcome to the show, Christian. Thank you so much for coming on. It's a pleasure to have you here with us today. Hey, Mighty Pete. I'm so happy to be here with you. I've been looking forward to this conversation. Thanks for having me. So, Christian, you are a number of things. Well, you have a number of labels, let's just say. So the first being you are a best-selling author and of the book Awakening, The Soul of Power. And there's so much more there, really. But um, you're an award-winning author. You're an acclaimed speaker. Uh, you have done a TEDx talk as well. Amazing. Mm -hmm. And really, you sort of also practice as a spiritual coach and also in leadership development consultant ranging from individuals, couples, private practice, and major corporations. So you're a busy man, Christian, are you? That is all true. And yes, I'm busy. I keep busy. <laughs> so who are you then? Who, who mainly are you deep down? You know, I've always been driven by a sense of mission. Um, and that's still the case. And it's just shown manifested or expressed itself in different ways at different points in my life. So for example, when I was a teenager, uh, I thought I was going to be a priest. I was raised in a, in a very Catholic family and I, and I thought I was going to be a priest. Um, and, you know, realized at some point, in my late teens, that the religion in which I was raised didn't have room for me. Um, so these days it expresses itself in a different way. You know, once I, I went through that phase of, of questioning, um, which took me through most of my, my 20s, by the end of my 20s, um, and this was reminded when we're talking about right before the, the in the pre-interview, you know, but I, I hit that point of there has to be more to life than this. And I, and I used those exact words because my life was pretty enviable. I had a nice cushy job, an apartment on the water in, in Miami Beach and South Beach, right when the Renaissance was happening there. And, and yet it seemed to me the more that I had and the more that I was sought after, the more that there was something missing. And so I went, started a, a phase of, of searching, which took me to where I am today. Like within months, I quit my job and broke up a relationship that I was in at the time and gave away, gave away and sold everything and went off on a spiritual journey. Never took a corporate job since then. Um, and it's been a, you know, haven't looked back. So, so what drives me is that sense of, I guess, paraphrasing Einstein, that you can't solve a problem from the same level of consciousness in which, in which it was created. So when I look at the world and the shape that we're in and all the problems that we're facing, phasing that sometimes just feel overwhelming, just any one of them. Um, to me, the way that, that we dig ourselves out of this hole that we have collectively dug ourselves into is we've got to think outside the box and, and it's nothing short of a, of a leap in consciousness or spiritual revolution that, that I feel is what's called for. That's good. I, so thinking outside the box, I mean, it is is that thinking outside of yourself or is that looking and thinking that there's something else out there that you need to connect to, do you think? I think we look in ourselves, you know, for, for the answers. I think we're, that's where all the answers are. Um, what I mean by looking, by thinking outside of the box is not from like the way that the world looks at it, the way the consensus reality. Um, you know, I don't think that we solve it by just throwing more money at it. I think I think what what's needed is it's you know, like I say a revolution a shift in the way that we think about ourselves about each other and our relationship to the earth to this tiny pebble um, you know hurtling through space at thousands of miles per hour um, and and yet so delicate the, the the balance of life is so delicate. And we've forgotten about that. And, and so I think that's the beginning, you know, that, that shifting of that relation, relationship to all of it, which really begins by shifting the relationship to ourselves. Mm. Oh, wow. I can tell we're going to go. We're going to go to some, some awesome places here. But before we do, can I ask, what, what do you feel that fire in the belly means? You know, I love, I love that that's the title of your book. And to me, that's, it's passion. It's, it's what inspires us, what, what drives us, what, what makes time stop, um, what, you know, turns us, turns us on spiritually. Um, 
that that's what that means to me is it something do you have it have you always had it i think i've always had it you know like i said it it's it's shown revealed itself in different ways but i think it it i've always had the sense of of mission the sense of making a difference um in the world the, the sense of of you know serving something greater than ourselves um which again has evolved the way that i think about and relate to to all of that um but the constant um has been there it, it's always been there and 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 i think it's it it's been a good match to the skill set that i seem to have come in with um, you know so if, i remember even as a kid um, I was naturally the you know mediator or peacekeeper. Like people came to me, even older people came to me for advice and, and perspectives. Um, so it's somehow it's I guess it's what the Buddhists call right livelihood. Um, what I what I do it's a good match for for who I am. I mean, do, do, do you think? I mean, talking about nature and nurture, do you, do you think that was just built into you with, upon arrival as such? You know, that's that's a good question. Uh, my, I mean, maybe part of it I picked up through osmosis from my dad, who was a psychiatrist. Um, and, you know, I think part of it, too, was that early on, like even before I really understood what sex was about, I, I knew that I was gay. Um, and as you can imagine, that it, you know like back then it was it wasn't as out and as open as there aren't as many support systems uh, so for me it was really really difficult to try to reconcile who i am um, in my essence and the religion in which i was raised which told me that i was going to burn in hell for eternity so like you know here here i had this part of me that wanted to serve the sacred as i understood it then and, and yet being told that there was no rule for me in that religion, which led to a lot of pain. Like I can say my adolescence was one long depression with, with suicidal thoughts here and there. Um, and, but the benefit of that, the, the upside of that is that having to face myself and my inner demons and face such profound existential questions at such a young age, um, I think it gave me a head start. And, and it added a certain sense of depth and understanding um, to me, which for which I'm really grateful now. And that's interesting. You know, when we're reconciling it all, I mean, do you, do you think you are where you're supposed to be and that you, were, you had to go through that journey? I know that I'm, I know that I am where I'm supposed to be. And, you know, I try not to second guess the journey. Um, it is what it is, you know, it's, it's what my life seems to have have um, brought me to. Um, but but I think the place that I've gotten to is is it's healthy. It's like I, I wouldn't undo any of it because, you know, the pain, the alienation that I went through, um, the, the self doubt, all this, the self hatred, all that kind of stuff. Is, is being used for good. So, so the pain and the alienation allowed me to understand and to empathize with somebody else's pain. Like the details may be different, but I get existential pain. And I know how to, how to get out of self-hatred and self-doubt and morph that into self-confidence and self-acceptance and self-love uh, because I went through it. So I wouldn't change it. I wouldn't change any of it. And if you're sort of auditing your own life, I mean, how, how close do you feel that you are between your true self and who you are today? I mean, is, is there much of a gap, do you think, for you? Or is that something that's been collapsed or you work on? You know, I, one way that I love the word integrity, which, you know, for most of us has to, you know, we has that kind of moral overtones. Mm to have integrity or not. But if we think about it, integrity comes from integer, whole number. Uh, so another way of looking at integrity is, is wholeness. And, and that's the word that I resonate with. Like I feel whole. I feel like, you know, I don't feel like I'm complete. I don't feel like I'm done. And I think how boring would it be if, if we get to a place where we stop growing? 
I think that is an ongoing process, but the way that it feels to me is like I've, I've gotten to such a profound level of self-knowledge, uh, self-acceptance, and self-love in that order um, that like I'm I'm happy where I'm happy, I'm content, I'm fulfilled. That that level of, of self-love is pretty unshakable. So no matter the details of my life, the circumstances, whether a relationship works out or it doesn't, whether a project succeeds or it fails, in quotes, I never ever question my sense of self. Like I, I seem to have gotten to a place where like I I'm just establishing that, and it's pretty unshakable. Mm. Well, I mean, uh, did you come across, you know, sort of defining moments when you had to choose to be, you know, because I'm, you know, and you talk about sort of, you know, coming out as gay and, you know, really elements there, the priesthood, and then also your decision to, you know, go search for more. I mean, they're sort of fairly key defining moments, right? Or maybe they weren't. I don't want to put words in your mouth. You no, know, for sure, for sure, there were there were, there have been key defining moments, and one of them was, you know, in my in my late teens and my early twenties, um, you know, where where I I'd had you know I had been active sexually as a teenager, so I'd had um, sexual encounters, but all hidden and and filled with you know like kind of in the down low and uh, guilt ridden. Um, and then in my late, in my, I think I was 19 when I, when I fell in love for the first time. And for the first time, I felt that that combination of, I understood what making love was about. And, you know, I, I, I'll never forget the first kiss because in that moment, and it, it was a moment, um, like I just knew that being gay wasn't wrong and it wasn't sinful, and it wasn't bad, and it wasn't an illness. And from that moment on, there wasn't a priest or a minister or a rabbi or an imam or a psychiatrist that could tell me otherwise. I knew, I knew like in my, in my cells uh, that it was, what I had experienced was so beautiful that I could not be wrong. Um, and so what happened then is that I, you know, I, came, I, I threw the baby out with a baptismal water. Um, I wanted nothing to do with, with, God, as I understood it then with religion, I couldn't, I couldn't accept that if there was a deity that intervened in human affairs in, in a personal way, um, how could it, how could it, how could it accept um, the, the, such needless pain and suffering because of misinterpreted and mistranslated moral teachings, not, not only in my own case, but in the case of countless millions of people throughout human history who have gone to their death feeling like they missed the mark or there was, there was something wrong with them because of those teachings that were taken out of their cultural and historical context. So, so you know, like, like a little bit, and, and just a year before I had, I had met with my last uh, year of high school, I had met with, um, I went to a Jesuit all-boy high school. And I met with the head of the novitiate, the guy who decided who got in and who didn't. And thankfully, he was a wise man who, who said, well, why don't you do a couple of years of college and, and then we'll talk. So in those, in those two years, several things happened. One was that experience of falling in love combined with a philosophy class I took in college on existentialism that began a process of questioning um, not only the Catholic worldview, but um, way beyond that. And, and then I started a phase of experimentation with mind, exa- mind expanding substances. And that combination um, was really powerful. And after which the, the Jesuits just never stood a chance. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So that was definitely a, a, a primary phase in my life. I'm curious now, I mean, would you see yourself as spiritual or religious? Oh, definitely spiritual. Definitely spiritual. I don't belong to any one religion. I'm, I can honor and I'm fed by different traditions. Hmm. Um, but I don't think there is one that can just contain me. Um, so I look at different ones. I, I honor them all. I challenge them all. Uh, so, you know, from my perspective, 
they all hold a piece of the truth and they all, they're all valid paths to getting to that ultimate um, goal, which is reconnecting with an experience of in a personal relationship of the sacred. Um, and so to the degree that a religion is doing that, then great, they're doing, it's doing its job. To the degree that it's helping to make us more connected, more empowered, more, more loving um, and generous um, people, then great. Uh, they're doing their job and to the degree that they're fomenting separation and distance and you know what I call the theological pissing contest my religion is better than yours um, then you know that they're they're bringing about hate and separation then I think that needs to be challenged it's I mean do you think sometimes and, and we're going to wrap up all of religions here but it's <laughs> you know it's, it's like they've taken a message but then they've put it's, it's an interpretation right and then yeah. it's, the, it's the interpretation in itself of saying well this is what this means you know this has happened or this sign or this message or whatever therefore it is a you know i mean i, I love the way you put it I, i'm i'm a believer i'll chat to anyone it's like but as soon as you try and push your religion thought opinion etc onto me as this is this should be my truth well, then I have a slightly <laughs> different view upon it then at that point, right? Yeah. So we all have a right to an opinion, but also it's, um, what's my point? My point is, you know, really it's that, <laughs> um, you know, I suppose it's, 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 it's interpretation. Everything's interpretation, right? Yeah. And, and, and there's some commonalities, um, and, and there's so many myths that are just part of woven through human history that show up in different ways or in similar ways than in, in different religious traditions. And, you know, if we, at, at the core, like if, if we look at, for example, the golden rule, the, the ethic of reciprocity, um, do us to others as you would like them to do unto you. Like if we live by that one thing, what a different world, right? And you can find a version of that in every single religion. So what if we focused on that rather than on, on the superficial differences? Yeah. What triggered you to, you know, in that sort of, I think you were saying the early 20s there, you know, not just to continue going off and living your life at that time, but to actually say, no, I have, I have an itch here that needs to be scratched and I can no longer wait what what triggered that change if you don't mind me asking yeah well i don't know that i have an answer for you i i think i i think it's you know call it a divine impulse i think that we all have a, a version of that in, in, inside of us some something that is you know call it the fire in the belly um it's you know it's 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 that deep level longing for more um for for a longing for connection, um, a, a thirst for for understanding and for inner peace, um, and and I think a drive to express what's inside of us. You know, because we're all unique, and that's almost like cliche to say it. But there, the the truth is that there isn't anybody in this universe or any other universe, for that matter, that has the same genetics, the same set of experiences that make each one of us unique. If we don't give expression to that, nobody else is going to do it. So, so for me, that's that's what ultimately drives me for sure. And what I think what drives most of us is that desire that that almost like a, being compelled to express that unique human potential. Um, and and I think you know that most of everybody listening to this or watching this. Um, has lived long enough to know that no amount of money, no, no amount of sex, no amount of experiences, no amount of possessions, no amount of traveling um, is ever going to be enough. Like, and, and I hope that we've discovered that there isn't anybody out there that's going to make us happy. And how unfair to put that responsibility on somebody else. You are going to make me happy. It's like, yikes, mm -hmm. let's talk about a, a recipe for, for disaster. And, and so once we really get that, uh, I, I, you know, my belief is that my experience is that the only thing that is really going to fulfill us is to discover who we are, to dive deep within and to give expression to that fire in the belly, 
to that you, divine impulse, whatever you want to call it, to that whatever it is inside of us that is demanding expression. That's I mean, that's a really interesting point. I mean, you talk about almost the empowerment of others to try and give us the satisfaction, right? And which is a it's a very roundabout way of gaining energy. So we please them they process it and see it as a good thing and thereby sort of feel grateful, feel thankful to us, right? So then that makes us feel better until it doesn't. <laughs> right. Right. And and what I've and what I've learned is that the stronger our sense of self, like the the like the greater our, our and the deeper our sense of, of self-knowledge and self-acceptance the less that we depend on anything outside of us, the less that we need anybody's validation, the less, the, the less that anybody's judgments or expectations have an impact on us. What for you was something that you had to get over within yourself to allow you to move forward? I mean, is there, is there anything that, you know, that you, where you blocked yourself that you can think of? Well, I mean, starting with with you know the self hatred, be from that misunderstanding um, that I had gotten from conditioning from society and culture and religion mm. uh, that there was something wrong with me. Um, so that was a huge. That was the probably the biggest obstacle, and and realizing that was just a misunderstanding. Um, that my inherent worth, my inherent value, does not depend on any thing outside of myself um, and, and it's and it's really you know that i've worked with that i think that so many people struggle with that i think most of us struggle with with a constellation of that you know there, there's something wrong with me i'm not good enough uh, i'm too much of this not enough of that and all of it misunderstandings you know from from things that we misheard or misinterpreted or personalized from early childhood and then we we took it on as, as truth when it had nothing to do with us or nothing like, like just because we heard something or misheard something um, doesn't make it true. Um, and, and so for me, that is the journey of discovery, the, the heroic journey of the self-discovery and self-expression is, is learning how to, how to become self-referent, you know, how to go within, how to discover our own inherent worth because like, like even logically, it doesn't add up. Like, like if we ask anybody, wouldn't you say that any human being, any one of the 7 billion of us, however many we are now, um, you know, just by virtue of being human, we're inherently worthy. We, we deserve to be loved. Uh, we deserve to have lives that, that are filled with meaning and purpose. Like, wouldn't we say that just about any, any one of us? So then what makes us so special that we are the only one in 7 billion who, who are not worthy, who don't deserve to be loved? It's like, it just doesn't make sense. So, so they're just misunderstandings. And um, I mean, I feel so grateful that I was able to, to transcend that and to heal that and to overcome that um, and have been instrumental in, in helping many, many people do the same. That's... I mean, just that sort of ability to understand your own inner chatter is, is huge, right? You know, the inability to, you know, hear the own voice inside you, but the different voices, right? I suppose is the, the egoic mm -hmm. voice that says you're this, you're, you know, you're a bad person because of X, Y, Z. And that's, that's a little bit of truth with a whole lot of story, right? I mean, that's, <laughs> right. right. is that not, you know, is that not our lives through and through? We, we, we take, a one-off event or something and then we we attach all this story and all this reasons and you know everything else to it and then we end up where we are today for yeah. whatever reason yeah and 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 the most tragic part of all that is that most of it is happening subconsciously like we're not even aware why we do the things we do mm -hmm. so we're we're being driven by stuff that that happened to us when we were kids and because it was too much for us to handle it we suppressed it and we stuffed it but that stuff just doesn't go away, right? So it's still having an impact on the quality of our lives and our relationships from the subconscious. So that's why, you know, Carl Jung said, you know, the psychologist said that the process of enlightenment is having the, the, the unconscious, having the, supporting the unconscious to become conscious. 
Um, and, and so that's what my work is, has really been, not only my own personal work, but my professional work, my mission level work, work is helping people understand that. And you said a word that I think is key, ego. Um, because if we want to have relationships that work, if we want to have a life that is filled with meaning and purpose, if we, if we have to have, if we want to have a sense of personal empowerment, we've got to understand what the ego is. To me, that is primary. That's why I began not only the, this book, but every one of my retreats for the last 30 years with that understanding, helping people understand that, because there's so much confusion about it. You know, for, for those of us who know the word, we'll think, you know, arrogance, in, inflated sense of self, like she's got a big ego, he's got a big ego, and it is that, but it's so much more than that. Um, and then maybe if we took Psych 101 in college, we might think, oh, Freud's model of personality, the, the id, the ego, the super ego. And, and what, the way that I teach the ego and, and understand the ego is more derived from Eastern teachings. So it's a part of the mind, a part of the psyche that makes sense of sensory information, um, synthesizes it, organizes it, can reach into the past project into the future and somehow weave all of that into a coherent sense of self, which is what ego means in Latin is I. Um, and so it's, it's a false sense of identity. And, and so, and it's at, at the same time, a leap in evolution, as far as we know, we're the only species that has that individual sense of personality. And it's also the source of all our suffering. Um, and, and so, I mean, we don't really have time to dive deeply into the ego, but here's a beautiful, um, visual that helps us understand them. If you put a football um, in, in the center of a stadium, that's what the ego is. Who we are is actually the stadium. And we've allowed this tiny, tiny, tiny part of who we are to think that it is all of who we are. And, and not only that, but to make really important, consequential choices about our lives and what we do with them and about our relationships from its very small limited and always fear-based perspective. So if we wanna be free, that's the first step is understanding what the ego is and so that we can let ourselves free from its self-made prison. I mean, how is your ego through the years? I mean, I'm sure there's, there's been highs and day and lows, right? You know, cause you, your own journey that you've gone through and then you have the ego that goes with it that tries to, to reconcile and make good or to, to keep the ripples down, right? Yeah, yeah, you know, well, 30 years into it, um, the ego's kind of chilled out. My ego's, I mean, still there, because I think that's also a misunderstanding in some circles that you got to kill the ego that you can't, you can't, you know, because, the, because it is the source of all our suffering. And that part of it is true. My understanding of it is that it's not all bad. Like, I mean, to have a sense of self, it's not a bad thing. Um, and there are some other functions of the ego that are that are helpful the, the problem is that we have allowed the ego to to run the show and and so my my you know my, my experience of it is not not getting rid of it not annihilating it but putting it in its proper place so the ego has kind of assumed the place of the sun and it think it thinks that it is the center and it, it thinks it is who we are so so what we're going for i think rather than killing it is healing it um, and putting it in its proper place in orbit around and in service to the sun. And so with a lot of you know, self-awareness, um, my ego hardly gets triggered these days. And when it does, I can nip it at the bud. So before it reacts, before it defends, before it attacks, when it feels threatened, I can nip it in the bud and, and just immediately identify it as ego and choose rather than react, right? Choose how I want to deal with a particular situation rather than just react from um, its unhealed um, wounds and past and, and you know, from buttons that we haven't even looked at. I mean, for you, how do you learn about yourself? I mean, are you able to spot these, these patterns in yourself? I mean, this sort of ego behavior, this retraction or this... Um, your own position and performance, perhaps. I mean, are you good at self-reflecting on your position and where you are and where you're going to? Oh my God, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, in the beginning, you know, the self, this journey of self-reflection and self-observation and understanding ourselves and why we do the things we do um, and managing the ego is, it's hard. And, and in the beginning, it's sort of like, 
wrestling you know, with a demon. Um, but eventually it aligns and it eventually becomes second nature. And, and like I say, you know, like these days, years go by before I get triggered. Because we're, because you know there's there's we under once we understand the ego and it, and its patterns and what once we understand not only ourselves but we understand it in other humans because we all have one, then it's easy not to th- not to take things personally. Like once you understand, for example, projection, and which is one of the functions of the ego to to project onto others what's really inside of ourselves as well that we can't accept. Then you know when when people are projecting stuff at us we understand that as that and there's we, there's no need to react right we can actually handle it with compassion and understanding rather than taking it personally and defend or attack back which is what the ego does the ego walks around with you know in a constant state of of uh, defcon one just just waiting for the next attack um you know with all protected and just waiting for the next shoe to drop and 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 we feel like to walk around like this is, is powerful but it's not to walk around in the state of being is prison it's like it's like oh my god like to be able to open up our arms and 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 have this kind of open relationship with life is actually more vulnerable but it's actually where the power is because it's it's a different relationship with life that says, you know what, life, I got this. Whatever you throw my way, I know I'm going to be able to, to handle it. And, and so we can walk around in a state of openness, not stupidly, right? Not opening our hearts to people who have consist, consistently failed to show up or betrayed us or, or lied to us, not stupidly, but our fundamental relationship with life uh, transforms into a trusting one rather than than one of feeling victimized or done to by life or one that is kind of uh, you know adversarial like like me against the world kind of thing uh, which is all f- stems from the misunderstanding of the ego so so once we get that once we step outside of the limited perspective of the ego and into the realm of the stadium of the stadium um, everything changes and we and we and we step into a kind of a, a world that, you know, that we somehow don't really have the words for it. But, but we would then label like you know a life that is filled with magic and miracles, um, because it's a different, almost like a different reality, a different um, world, you know, with different laws of physics, physics even. It's, you know. Understanding what is magic and what is a miracle is is challenging in itself, right? Because the conscious mind mm-hmm. says, "I only can believe what I see," and that's right. You, know, you can't necessarily you can talk about it, but you can't, you know, you can't engineer, you can't force someone to sort of, you know, feel that magic or feel the miracles, right? Yeah, except I think we have all had moments of it, you know, just moments of you know synchronicity is another another word things that just defy rationality or that just we cannot explain or you know they're just simple things like you know we're thinking about somebody and then they they call us on the phone that kind of thing that just there's no logical explanation for yet at least our understanding and, and where we are in terms of science right now we don't know how that works um you know, I, I think it's, it's you know, like what, what religion and spiritual traditions have told us that we're all interconnected. I think science is beginning to, to it's not quite there, but it's beginning to find support for that. Um, and, you know, things that we just, that just don't make sense to the ego mind, to the rational mind that wants to control everything and figure everything out and has to have, you know, the five-year plan and, and all that kind of stuff and tries to control it all uh, when, the truth is that there is nothing in life that is controllable, hmm. except how we show up in response. Yeah, and you've got to want to do that, don't you? You have to, you want to, love to, get to, right? As opposed to should, could, might, maybe. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it's it's a leap in consciousness, really. You know, when because if we're on a journey of personal empowerment, you know, as long as we are 
because I, because that is part of the human condition to feel victimized what by right if only mom had had done this or dad hadn't done that if only the teacher or the minister or society or if if it wasn't for um, sexism or misogyny or racism or homophobia if only I had been born to a different family in a different social setting um, and socioeconomic status then I would be different, then I would be happy. But if, if we're, as long as we're holding anyone or anything outside of us, we're giving our power away to that. And, and by the way, it doesn't deny that those things didn't happen. And it doesn't deny that those that the system is set up unfairly, that, that, that does exist, but it doesn't matter, right? It's, it's because one thing that we can count on is that life is gonna continue throwing curveballs our way. And, and, and so that's, that's just the way it is. But if, if we're going to give our way, our power to what happened in the past or, or to unforeseen events that are going to happen because that they are going to happen, just stuff is going to happen that we just didn't see coming. Um, then we're giving our power away. But here's a, a way to reframe that, that, that pops us back into, into agency and into personal empowerment. So no matter what happened in the past, no matter what happens going forward, we can always, always choose how we show up in response. And, and once we just reframe that, that pops us out of that victim mindset and that victim state of consciousness. It's amazing. That and that's any, sort of, anybody can do that. It's all about choice. It's all about choice. That's where the power is. You're saying anyone can do that. I mean, what does it, what does it take? It takes, it takes that choice and the willingness, which is the hard part, mm. to give up the poor me, yeah. the the victim mindset. It's so hard to see yourself, though, isn't it? Really, I mean, we're we're all professionals when it comes to pointing at somebody else and saying they should be doing this or they could do that or whatever, but yet we miss our own fate or our own thing, really. I'm just wondering, is it is it better to be mentoring or mentor, you know, being mentored, you know, and, and where the power lies, you know? Because imagine different people are going to get inspired by different things, you know, potentially if you're inspired being in a room full of people who have a similar problem or vice versa, is it better to isolate them and, and take on your own uh, treatment per se, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways. I don't know. I don't know that there's a, you know, one, one way to that's going to work for everybody. I think different models or systems might be better, might be more suitable for different personalities. Um, but I, th but there are some things that I think are pretty universal, like, like a, like we've been talking about understanding the ego. Um, everybody has one, right? And, and, and it's pretty universal how it works and how it keeps us in, in that self-made prison of fear and um, you know, judgment, expectations, demands, all, all the kind of stuff of taking everything personally. And, 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 you know, and, and that victim mindset, that victim mindset, which is also part of the ego um, level of consciousness, um, it's pretty universal. And so what the, the, the reason that we struggle with that, with that letting go of the victim is because it kind of lets us off the hook, yeah. right? It's, we don't have to show up and we can blame something that happened or, or, some, or some system for our current state of being. But again, like it keeps us stuck. It keeps us in that prison. So there's a price to pay. For, for, for not owning it, for not taking accountability for all of our life, no matter what happened and no matter what happens. And, and it's not to minimize anybody's pain. It's like, hey, stuff happens. Stuff happens that should never happen to any human being. And I'm so sorry about the stuff that happens. Should have never happened. And we've got to take a deep breath. And another one, I put one foot forward and how am I, how am I going to show up in response to that? Am I going to let it get the best of me? 
or am I gonna am I gonna you know make some lemonade out of those lemons? You talk with your coaching and all that. You talk a lot about being a transformation coach as opposed to inspiration motivation, right? You know, is that first of all is that fair? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I do inspire and motivate. But for me, like the real power with the real service is in transformation. And, and, and facilitating that process of transformation in others and yeah, and, and, and what I teach and how I help others facilitate that comes from experience. Yeah, of course, I've read a lot of books and, you know, I have a degree in psychology, so I've gotten a lot from here and there. But the, the actual process of transformation is like stuff that I've lived. Uh, so, you know, it's like I walk my talk um, and, and I still, you know, all the practices that, and teachings that I share with others is stuff that I live by. It's not just conceptual stuff. Uh, so it's, you know, and I've got 30 years of, of a proven track record with countless people who've gone through my retreats and my events whose lives have been transformed. Um, so it works. It works. Are you something you wanted to, you know, you want or wanting to achieve in that, in that field then in terms of what's possible or um, a awareness, if you like, of what what the drugs are and what's possible today, given the different sort of types of drugs? Yeah, yeah, that's a beautiful question, Mighty Pete. Uh, you know, and it goes back to that Einstein thing, you know, the, the leap in consciousness. And, you know, because sometimes when I look at the world, um, you know, it can be really overwhelming. I mean, just to look at what's happening with the environment or, or what can I do personally about terrorism or the increased uh, polarization um, between people in the world, uh, the, the rising um, fear-based tides of authoritarianism in the world. Like any one of those things can be overwhelming, like, like the plague, you know, the pandemic. What can I, what can I do about that? Um, and so sometimes I feel, you know what, forget it. This is too much work. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go to the beach and eat a lot of dark chocolate and have a lot of sex. Um, and then I say, all right, dude, chill right? Reel myself back. What can I do? Um, all right, so what can I do? I can continue to, to heal myself, to empower myself, to, to, to step into my own um, power and purpose, um, and, and to continue supporting my own process of spiritual evolution. Okay, I can do that, and I can help as many people as I can to do the same. And hopefully, uh, Pete, this is what I'm banking on, that there is something to that critical mass thing, that there is something to that hundredth monkey effect, that at some point, enough of us wake up, and then things shift. And, and I know that the original story about the hundredth monkey um, turned out to be myth. It wasn't quite the way that it happened, but I still, I'm still banking on that critical mass thing. And so that's my work. That's my mission. You know, like one person at a time, one soul at a time. That's a great mission, right? Because that takes a lot of the vanity out of it saying, well, listen, it is about helping one person. You know, we don't always need stages crowned, you know, and, and venues crowned with venues, right? You know, to make an impact, you can make an impact with one. In fact, you can probably make an impact on yourself, you know, with less yes. than one. Yes, yes. If we did, if we did nothing but free ourselves and empower ourselves, that would be plenty. Hmm. That would be enough. Talk to us about the book. How did it come about, and, and what were your intentions with it? Well, I think in, in in a way it'd been brewing inside of me because I'm kind of an unlikely person to be to be speaking about personal empowerment and what it means to live heroically in the 21st century because because of what I was saying earlier it's like my adolescence was one long depression um, and, and you know I started thinking about this our relationship to power um, some some years ago probably like 10 years ago um, and 
had been sitting in meditation and for only the second time in my life, now it's happened three, but this was the second time that where I actually heard audible words. And the words were the soul of power. Like, you know, I've been minding my own business. I wasn't thinking about anything and then just heard those words. It's like, huh, interesting. Got up from meditation and got the URL and forgot about it. Um, a year later, I mean, not a year later, three months later, I had submitted a, a, a book proposal to an agent, literary agent that I was working with at the time in New York um, on a different theme. And so she got back to me and said, um, yeah, I want to work with you, but I want to see some of, some of these marketing ideas that, that you have to put forth in a, in a book proposal. Uh, I want to see some of, some of them actually implemented before we pitch it to a publisher, which would have taken me probably a year to implement those marketing ideas. So it was like, ee, you know, putting on the brakes. And it sent me into a tailspin for a few days because I was spending the advance in my mind. Um, and so then, like, then, then, my, then the question became, all right, so if I'm not going to write for an advance, what would I really write about? And for years, I've been saying in my retreats and my workshops and in my writing that the, the single most important thing that needs to happen in the world is the empowerment of women. And, and it's, I say that not to idealize women, not to put women up on a pedestal, not to give women more crap that they have to clean up in this world, but it's because the, as a planet, as a species, we've been working and functioning so off kilter where it comes to power between and, and the balance of the energies between the masculine and the feminine. Um, and so then I thought, all right, women's empowerment. And, and, and I believe that when women are in 50% of power in the world, we're going to have a very different relationship to war and poverty and hunger and social justice and how we treat the environment to all of it. So, so when I think about it strategically, you know, like how can we, how do, how do we dig ourselves out of this hole that we have dug ourselves into? That is the one thing that I land on that will then impact many other, many other areas that we're being challenged by. So then, then the realization was like one of those, you know, palm to the forehead, uh, da moments. Um, all right, women's empowerment, soul of power. It's like, wow, no, that's interesting. How do we step into power in a different way? How do we step into power in a different way that is not about power over, but power with? That is not hierarchical. That doesn't require that, that I push anybody down or step on them in order for me to feel powerful. How do we step into power in a way that's not about fear, domination, force, control, um, manipulation? How do we do it in a different way? Because what I've realized that is that most of us have an ambivalent, and I would even say conflicted, relationship to power. There's a part of us that wants it, and then there's a part of us that's afraid of it. And I think what that fear is, what we fear, is that if we stepped into our power fully, that if we really bead all of who we are, that other people wouldn't, couldn't handle it, and that we would end up rejected and alone. And who wants that? We also fear that we might abuse it. And no wonder, like how many abuses of power have we witnessed throughout our lives? And all we got to do is on any given day, turn on the news or glance through the headlines online to, to witness at least one abuse of power. And, and then add to that, that we've been conditioned to believe that power is a bad thing, that power is negative, with quotes like power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. What they didn't tell us about that quote is that Lord Acton was speaking specifically about political power, not personal power. So when you add to that mix, the fact that we have been conditioned to fear the emotions, we've labeled the emotions weakness, we hate conflict, we avoid confrontation. You put all that together, what happens is that we end up giving away our power, our innate, inherent power that nobody can give to us. Nobody can take it away. We are the only ones who can give it away. And sadly, tragically, we, we give it away for the lamest of reasons. We, we say yes when inside we feel no for an illusion of security. We sell ourselves short. We settle for, for crumbs uh, of pseudo love and, and for a false sense of acceptance. And it doesn't, doesn't work. I mean, not self-love. I mean... That's a life mission, right? It is. It's a life mission. Do you like yourself? And, and a never-ending process. Pardon? Do you like yourself? Do you love yourself? I do love myself. 
deeply. Deeply. Not that's everything, right? That that to me it's 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 all of it. I think that is you know part of part of this journey of of embodiment. Um, I think that's what it's about. Um, and and you know and it be, begins with self awareness. And they're going back to that because we can't do anything about what we're not aware of. And, and so that's the the first step. Self awareness makes possible self acceptance, which then opens the door for self love. And none of it is easy. It's work. You know, it's, it's, it's a lot easier to go through life kind of buffeted, buffeted by other people's expectations and demands and the conditioning of, of society and what people think we should do and, and all of that stuff, life's ups and downs, to pause and to say, wait a minute, it's my life. I get to make all these choices about what I do with it. It's, 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 and, and to be willing then to do the work that that entails, to figure out, to go within and, and discover and fight our own inner demons and so that they can be healed. Um, and it, it's, it's heroic and so worthwhile. And so, so that's why this book is the, the first of a series of three. And the title of the series is Calling All Heroes because what we're talking about is heroic work. It takes work, but the rewards are infinite and indescribable and priceless. What's a, what's a great question to ask yourself when, you know, if you, if you are looking or seeking that thing and I mean, is it down to, you know, can you, you know, are you in coherence with yourself or are you in coherence with love with yourself? Or you tell me well, what's a good question to, for people to ask themselves? Yeah, I think that it's a beautiful, powerful question. Um, I think there might be other questions that that precede that. You know that that are. I think that the one the question that you asked, which is a profound question, um, might be a little further down the road, because sometimes we don't even know who we are. Mm. Right, so we don't know what coherence with self means. So I think the first step is discovering who we are and what makes us do the thing we do, the things we do. And, and so, you know, if that's a great question like, to, to begin with. What makes me do the things I do? And then to begin to observe ourselves, right? to begin to pay attention to ourselves. Like what kind of situations trigger us? You know, what, what and, then, and then begin to look for patterns. Because it, in the willingness to do that work, that's where the, the doors open to the possibility of, of healing and transformation. So here, here's an example of that. Let's say that you and I have a mutual uh, friend, Mary, who always shows up late. And so I have lunch with Mary on Mondays. You have lunch with her on Tuesdays. And so there I am on Monday, and Mary inevitably shows up 20 minutes, shows up 20 minutes late. And I'm like all in a huff, like she is so selfish and inconsiderate. She only cares about herself and, and, and doesn't care about my schedule and blah, 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 blah. You know, all the stories that we add to that. And so then Mary finally gets there. And because we hate confrontation, we don't say anything, but then that resentment starts dripping out the side of our, our, our mouth with, you know, a sarcastic joke or a little barbed comment. Um, and so if I'm stuck in that, that's all I'm gonna see. It's all about marriage being late. But if I'm willing to do the work of self-observation and, and ask myself, wait a minute, why is it that I get so upset when Mary shows up late? Because you, on Tuesday, Mary shows up late and you're like, great, Mary's late. I got 20 minutes to, refund, to, to, to return that phone call or to catch up on my email or to read that article online or to get on social media. It's like, right, so many different possible reactions to Mary's lateness. Why does it get me so upset? And it doesn't ex excuse Mary's lateness. It's not about that at all. It's about why does it elicit that response in me if I want to be free? So then if I'm willing to dive in and to do the work it's like, and, and to look at myself, it's like, you know, it's like, I might come up with like, all right, well, it's not just about Mary being late. So when anybody's being late, so it's not about Mary. And if I zoom out a little bit further, it's not just about lateness. So when anybody cuts me off in traffic or cuts me off in conversation, that elicits the same kind of feeling in me. 
all right, so I'm beginning to see a pattern here. What is that feeling? What am I really feeling? What's underneath the anger, which is the, this immediate reactive response? What's underneath it? Let me dig under there. What am I really feeling when people do that? All right, what am I feeling? I'm feeling disrespected. I'm feeling unseen. I'm feeling not appreciated. I'm feeling like maybe even not worthy. Right. So if and, and that's, you know, it's, it's vulnerable, like I have to be able to do that is heroic work. But it is so liberating because once I get to that core, then I can say, oh, wow, it has nothing to do with Mary. This is about my own feelings of not feeling respected or not feeling worthy that are way older than my my relationship with Mary. So once I get to that core, then I can do something about it. I can go to therapy, I can go to, I can go to breath work, I can, I can do whatever, go to coaching so that I can let that go and heal that. Then I can be free. And then anybody can show up late and nothing happens. Nothing, you know, that button has been flattened out. So, so it's really worthwhile to be willing to do this work. Yes, it's hard. Yes, it takes effort. Yes, it takes courage. And it is the rewards, like I said, are, are priceless because the reward is ultimately freedom. For people, I suppose, well, let's go this way. Who is your book for? My book is for anybody, you know, anybody who, who who has that fire in the belly, you know, anybody who has that longing to be more than they have ever been before. Uh, for anybody who wants relationships that have a chance at working, for anybody who wants that sense of personal empowerment or have a life that is filled with meaning and purpose. It has a particular message for women, right? Because, because what we were talking about before. But I also add a chapter on, you know, for men, specifically for men, because this hierarchical um, power overstructure, this patriarchal system, you know, of call it toxic masculinity, which I know it's, you know, it's a term that is being thrown around a lot these days, uh, but it, it, it's, it doesn't serve anybody, right? Including men. Like certainly it doesn't work for women who have been oppressed and, and living in an unequal state of being for the last several thousand years, but it doesn't serve men either because men have been caught in a prison. Uh, so, so, yeah, so let's look at a couple of numbers. The, the rate of suicide in the U.S., I don't have these for globally, but in the U.S., men commit suicide four times as frequently as women. And in fact, 70% of the suicides in the U.S. are committed by middle-aged white men, which, which you could say still hold the majority of the power in the world. So why is that? You, know, you would think that people who hold the power would have better quality of lives. Because also, you look, look at longevity. Women outlive men by five years. In the U.S., by seven years globally. What's up with that? And, and, and I think it's because of this limited definition and misunderstanding of what it means to be a man that we have, a, that we have allowed to be ruled by. Uh, and so, and, and it connects to what we're talking about before, that, you know, we walk around like this, like uncaring, unfeeling robots, because somewhere along the way, somebody decided that emotions were weakness. It's like, wait a minute. And, and you know, we've, we've been conditioned, little boys don't cry. Why is that? Because only little girls cry? because that's weakness, it's like, wait a minute, so many faulty assumptions in that. First of all, assuming that the female is weakness, like, wait a minute, you wanna talk about power? You wanna, you, you wanna talk about resilience? You wanna talk about courage? Let's talk about the power of creation that resides in a female body, right? And, and then also the assumption that the emotions are weakness is like, wait a minute, the emotions aren't strength, they're not weakness, they're not good, they're not bad, they're just energy. Like everything else, what used to be spiritual teaching, that everything is energy. Now we know from quantum physics that it's true, everything is energy. Energy cannot be destroyed, it can only change forms. So when we suppress those energies, the countless times in our lives that we haven't allowed ourselves to feel and to express what we're feeling countless times, that stuff doesn't go away. It gets repressed and it gets stuck into the tissues on our bodies. And after years and decades and a lifetime of suppressing our emotions, we walk around with layers upon layers upon layers of repressed emotional crap. 
And then here we are trying to have a relationship in the present. All of it is getting filtered through that lifetime of unhealed past trauma and repressed emotional crap. Yikes. I don't know how any relationship can work because we haven't been taught how to hold them, how to approach them. And we certainly haven't been taught about how to clear ourselves of that cauldron of emotional crap that we walk around with because that energy is gonna come out one way or another. So what happens is we repress, we repress, we repress, and then the next unfortunate one comes and, and says something to us the wrong way. They rub us the wrong way and boom, volcanic eruption. Inappropriate to that particular situation because it's been building up inside of us and then we cause harm to our relationships or repress, 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 that stuff is gonna come out one way or the other. And it's, if we don't, express it, give it, get it out, it's going to start seeping out and showing up as physical symptoms, heart attacks, cancer, ulcers, right? And I think that's what relates to the longevity issue with men, is that we haven't, you know, we carry so much more crap uh, because we've been so conditioned to, to believe that the emotions are weakness. Do you, do you subscribe? I mean, some people talk about, you know, the the conscious mind being almost a representation of masculine energy and the subconscious mind being representation of feminine energy. I mean, is that something you subscribe to or where do you sit with that? Hmm. I hadn't thought about it that way. I think, I mean, what's clear to me is that we all have masculine and feminine energies, right? Because that's, that's what makes up the universe yeah. and, and it's balanced in the universe except for us, because we're the ones that have suppressed the feminine because we've labeled it weakness or less than. It's like, which is kind of, it's just like, it's kind of dumb. Um, and here's, you know, here's, here's a, a, a funny story that I'm not gonna do it justice because there's only one Betty White. Um, but, you know, Betty White, apparently I read something as she was being interviewed. Uh, by you know one of those group interview settings and somebody said something about having balls and um, and she said wait a minute how is it that we got this connection about courage and strength with balls you know you thump those little things and the guy collapses over bends over in pain you want to talk courage and power and strength let's talk about vaginas those things take a pounding um, and, and you know obviously you know I'm not I'm not here to put men down obviously I like men um, but, but the way that we have been expressing our masculinity, it, it is so limiting. And so part of that's part of what I did in, in this chapter. Um, like, what does it mean to me? What does it mean to be a man in the 21st century? And so redefine some of these archetypal roles, uh, that we have played as men throughout history. So, um, you know, the provider role, which is one, which is one of the reasons so many men are struggling, um, because with, um, computers and, and machines, so many of the jobs that traditional men, that men traditionally did, are being replaced by computers. So a lot of men are just like, well, if, I, if I'm not. Um, and, and also, as women step into their power, you know, it's like, I think in the U.S., I, I think the numbers that I, that I reported in the book, I think it was from 2017, um, where we're now approaching 40% of heterosexual households in the U.S., the woman is earning more than the, than the man. And so if, if our identity as man, as a man, is, is re, it's limited by that, by that limited expression of, of the size of our paycheck, really, that's, really the, that's what we're going to allow to define us as men, then no wonder that so many men are struggling. And my heart goes out to them. I know, I know that we're in a huge transitional time and roles are being redefined. Gender roles are being redefined and expanded. And it's confusing. And systems that, that are no longer sustainable are imploding in front of our eyes. But, and, and so therefore, just going back to what we've been talking about, the, the way out is the way in, right? It's like, are we gonna define ourselves by such superficial things, but like the size of our paycheck? Really? Um, and, and so, but if we're willing to do the work and go within and really get in, in touch with, there's so many different other ways to assume and express that provider role. You know, what about providing a space, a, a psychological, emotional, spiritual place in your household where, where the, your, your children, your family can grow and step into their power and become more than they have ever been before? Wow, that's, that's talking provider. 
you know, providing providing that that psychological emotional rock on which our, our loved one can stand and then really full step into who they are like wow now we're talking have you found that self-reflection that talking to self is that something that came naturally for you yeah I, for me it did you know i'm, I'm naturally introverted hmm. um yeah and even though i'm one of nine kids you know so i was always surrounded by by others and you know didn't have my own bedroom till you know, I, I share my bedroom with three brothers up until you know, age night 18 or 19 when I moved out of home um, I think it was 19 um, maybe even 20 so so yeah so I think I think in my case I, that was part of and because I was facing those existential questions and asking who I was I naturally went inside you know so I, and I, I read a lot as a kid I think that's also one of the came from a benefit of, of having been raised in Cuba my first 10 years of life in a communist country like we had we had a tv but there was nothing worth watching so we grew up reading uh, and creating our our own games and i'm really grateful for that but i think that that experience of reading and going within um you know and i don't know is it going back to your point about nature or nurture i don't know i don't know whether we come in with that or whether it's a combination of both or whether it's response to, to situations in life hmm. Writing the book for you, I mean, is it uh, has it helped you to process where you are in your journey, or do you, for you was it just I had a calling, the book had to be written, and I continue on my journey, or how how do you view it from now that it's out there, it's you know got bestseller status, it got so many things and accolades. I mean, is it still part of you, or is it just something that came through you? That's a good question. Nobody, nobody has ever asked me that. I think, I, I think I see the book more as a means to an end. Like I don't, I don't think the book supported me in my own process of, of transformation. I think it was just a, a way of getting out there what's, what I've been living and what's been inside of my head and inside of my of my soul. Um, and and I think I. Like, like, I mean, that, I think I see it as a means to an end. Writing for me is like, I know I'm a good writer and, I've, and I get enough feedback about that. Um, and I think one of the reasons for that is that I had to learn English as a second language. So I had to learn the rules of, you know, like that a lot of people that grow up just speaking English just take for granted, but they don't really know the, the rules. Um, and, and so, I, and I know that I have a way with words, but for me, writing is is not like it is for other people that they love it and they get lost in it. For me, it's more work, um, and I that's I resist writing, um, and and yet to me it was part of, of my sense of mission. I knew that for me, writing the book was a way to reach more people, too, so that they so that I might be able to support them on their process of of transformation. And empowerment is that the overall mission in terms of the, the book and everything else it is you know how it's going to support others it's it's yeah you know yeah. it's um do you do you yeah. see it as its own entity the book hmm. well i mean it, it's interwoven into other parts of my work so for example um because of the pandemic I had to, like many other people did, I had to pivot and create virtual programming. I've been doing live retreats for 30 years. Suddenly I wasn't able to. Um, so I created a year long transformational coaching program. And, and so divided into different quarters. And, and what I do, so I use content from the book and, and, and I'll go back to doing retreats when it's, when, when it's safe to do so again. Um, but here's what I'm, I'm, I'm really appreciating about this, this year-long coaching program, because what it allows me to do is to spread out the teachings. 
deliver them bite-sized piecemeal over the course of the years. Because one thing I've noticed over the years is that people will come to one of my retreats and have this amazing transformational expansion, um, life-changing experience. And if they don't have a support system back home, if they don't have some kind of practice, some kind of reminder, some kind of accountability system, it's easy to forget and to get distracted by life's infinite distractions and the ADD society in which we live. And then, and then the old voices of fear and self-doubt start creeping up again and dragging them down. And then they got to come to another retreat, get a booster. Um, what, what I love about the system is I delivered the teachings piecemeal. And, and I deliver teachings from the book. A uh, little bit of content, just bite-sized each week. But here are the two key differences. One, interactivity. So there are always practices that go with the teachings. And, and I also include that in the book. I, I designed the book intentionally with short chapters and with power, you know, what I call power practices at the end of, of each. And those practices are designed to help us integrate the teachings so that they don't stay at the level of information because we don't need more information. We've got information overload. What we need is transformation to go back to that same word. Um, and so that would, that's what those practices are designed to do. And then the other thing that I can do in a year long that I'm not able to do on a weekend is accountability. Right? So every two weeks, they have a coaching call with me for two hours. Um, and in the in-between weeks, they're divided into what I call power pods, you know, small groups of two, three, four people. And, and so they also meet. And, and it's a way to, to both provide support so that we're not, we're not doing this alone. We're doing this as a group of like-minded others, committed people committed to their own freedom and empowerment and our collective process of evolution as well. And it provides accountability. Did you do what you said you were going to do? Right? Without judgment and harshness, it's just a system to keep us accountable. Is it important for us to reclaim our dark side? Oh, yeah. Without a doubt. And, and I think a, a word that I would use instead, instead is the shadow. You know, because the dark side, you know, to me, feels more like you know, Star Wars and the evil powers and stuff okay. like that. <laughs> um, I think shadow feels better to me in that it's it's all that stuff that we're talking about that we suppressed mm -hmm. that we, we're not ready to look at that we we stuff that in the back of a closet somewhere in the back of a drawer and, and that stuff doesn't go away so it's still having an impact you know that's the shadow stuff that that's having an impact from the subconscious um and and so yeah i wrote a piece a few years ago titled um you can't namaste the shadow away right because in, in the spiritual community um, there's a lot of like spiritual bypassing. No, I don't want to look at that stuff, right? I'm just going to be love and light. Um, and, and that stuff just, just doesn't go away. We can't leap over it. Um, and so it's, again, it's, it's part of that heroic journey of being a, being willing. It's courageous to look at that stuff, um, which is sometimes scary initially. Um, but it, again, it is so worthwhile. To, to face our inner demons. And that's why it's a heroic journey. And, and the, re the rewards are freedom and empowerment and the life of our dreams, relationships that actually have a chance of working. I'm still laughing at that. You cannot namaste your... <laughs> the shadow <laughs> away. The shadow away. It's so true, right? You know, and this is the one thing that does get me with goals and affirmations and so many things. It's like, if we chant it long enough, the other stuff will go away. It's like, mm, yeah, no, pretty sure it's like if it's a lump <laughs> in the carpet, it's always going to be a lump in the carpet. You know, it's like, why? I mean, that's it's denying the beauty of just of who you are, right? You know, it's yes, yeah. it's, it's also saying, well, listen, you know, you may be an untrustworthy person, or you may be something else, and and you know, that's maybe not who you are tomorrow, but that's who you are today or that's the acceptance thing of you know to reclaim your power all of your power not just the the happy stuff in fact there's probably more power in the dark side or the shadow side yes you. yes for sure for sure and and the other part of it is that we spend so much psychic mental energy suppressing that stuff avoiding it 
And, and so when we're willing to do that work of look at ourselves at all of ourselves, it's like we're freeing up so much energy that then we can devote to, you know, to the positive parts of life, towards growth, expansion, juiciness, um, to, to explore, to travel, to have relationships. Right? It, it's, we, and that's part of the reason we're so exhausted all the time because we're, we're trying to keep stuff under the surface and not think about it. That takes work. It takes work and, and, and how much more liberating we just get to be who we are rather than, than you know, like, like, like another aspect of that is we were this way at work, this way with our parents, this way with our lovers, this way with our friends. It's exhausting. Exhausting. What if we just got to be who we are, period? Yeah. It is. It's, it's, I mean, you think of the energy that's expended, you know, when there's a certain thing and then you spend as much energy to then repress it or suppress <laughs> it or depress it, whatever, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, yeah. and then you sort of like, hold on, did anyone see me do that? So I'll spend some energy <laughs> right. in trying to act normal at the same time. And just, <laughs> right, what, right. what are your goals? My goals are this, this, and this. It's like, what, right. what about this whole other bit? It's like, no, don't, don't look at that. That's fine. So much work. So much work. It's exhausting. Yeah. Yeah. What is achieved when, you know, through awakening, through that, you know, that's the soul of power. I mean, the title of the book, when that is implemented, what, what's the outcome? Oh my God, it's, it's, you know, it's everything we've been talking about. It's ultimately in one word, freedom. Um, just freedom to be who we are and, and freedom to, to, to make choices rather than be buffeted by life um, or, or to the freedom to just be who we are rather than to live by other people's expectations and demands and what we think other people think we should do, right? Because we're projecting what we think they think we should do. It's, it's insanity. It's out of our heads. And the freedom from, from the, the, that the harsh inner judge of the ego that, that drives us completely crazy, right? That's what the Buddhists refer to. The ego is what the Buddhists refer to as the monkey mind that, that, that is also exhausting because it's got something to say about everyone and everything every single moment of the day. And from even before our feet hit the floor, you know, even before we're out of bed, it's already thinking, it's already planning and, and you know, stuck in the past, rehashing the past. Oh, this is what I should have told her yesterday. And then projecting into the future or just wait till I run into her in the office. This is what I'm gonna say to her. And, and judging everything, worst of all our, ourselves. We are so cruel. That inner voice is so cruel. The, the, and so harsh, and then the things we say to ourselves about ourselves, we would never say to anybody else. And, and so that's what becomes possible. Once we understand who we are, once we become self-aware, once we're willing to do this heroic work of, of discovering who you truly, truly are, it, it's freedom, it's, it's peace of mind, it's only possibility. Um, you know, so once we're, once we're no longer being driven by subconscious repressed stuff and by misunderstandings from childhood that there was something wrong with us or that there's too much of this, not enough of that. Once we once we heal that and clear that stuff, then only possibility becomes is like who do we want to be? What are we passionate about? What do we want to do with this one precious life of ours? If you believe there's one life, do you? I don't have any evidence to the contrary, but I don't. I, I, I believe in reincarnation. And there is some, you know, there is evidence that reincarnation was in the Bible until like the 400s and that it was taken out of. That system makes more sense to me, um, but I don't have any evidence for that. I mean, there's, there's some books that I've read, like, um, what was it called? Brian, I forget his name. Many, I forget what it's called. Many lives, many masters, maybe. So like read it 30 years ago. Um, he's also he's a psychiatrist based in Miami and who, you know, did a lot of work and I think he's still doing work with uh, reincarnation. And some of the stuff he writes about, you know, memories that people have in this life that then you can actually find evidence for in, in, in the world. Like, you know, how, how can you argue against that? I don't know. But I don't have any personal experience with that. Hmm. What about, I mean, have you been here before, do you think? What's your gut feel? 
My gut feel is is yes. Is yes. Yeah. 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 I, I believe that. And here, so here's the closest I had to that. Um, when I was in high school, I had this, you know, this one of those the school counselors was a, a priest, a Jesuit, who was also a psychologist. And so I did some private work with him. And at some point he, he said, you know, we're doing this meditation process. And he goes, oh my God, I saw this image in your face. And I, and I think I know who it is. Next time I had a session with him, he showed me this book. And, and he, he said, this is who I saw. And it was Antinous, who was the Roman emperor's Hadrian, young Greek lover. And so in my mind, of course, sure, he's making this up. He's, he's just projecting his stuff onto me. I didn't really buy it. Um, but flash forward, I don't know, 15, 20 years, and a friend of mine who I was living in San Francisco in California at the time, and he went to Spain and he went to the museum, El Prado. Um, and when he get back, he goes, oh, by the way, I brought you this postcard. And it was this weird thing that I didn't bring anything for anybody, but I knew this was for you. And it was, um, it was a postcard of the bust of Antinous, which is like, hmm, well, that's interesting. Why would he even, I'd never had this conversation with anybody. How would he, how would he make that connection? Um, so, so that's the closest. And, and then, you know, I, I always had this, this thing with Greece. And, but when I went to Athens, I didn't feel like a sense of connection. But when I went to Rome, I did. Like I was in the old parts of Rome and I had this sense of familiarity. I kind of knew my way around. Um, and then I realized that Antinous probably didn't spend time in, in Greece, but probably spent time in Rome. So who knows? You know, this, this could all be somebody's fantasy, but that's the closest that I can, I relate to. I don't have any personal memories or other, you know, that's the, the closest that I can get to. Hmm. Well, it's always, as, as you say, there's no, there's, generally nobody can sort of prove it per se in terms of a you know a physical or a scientific or an engineering light but i mean then there's probably 95 percent of what goes on we can't explain either so we'll just add it to our collection right. of <laughs> we're pretty sure it is but we can't necessarily get a piece of paper to stick to it you know um, and that's okay yeah how about you do have you had any any memories of that and do you have any sense about that um i have a number of senses about it and actually through different uh therapies or treatments and all that you know there's sort of certain ones have come to light um can i prove it no can i you know can i really fence and sense and feel um what's been there then absolutely yes you know and that's the difference and but it's, it's even that for me, it's been a massive change in language that, you know, I genuinely believe that, you know, sort of uh, knowing is the, is the language of the, you know, is the voice of the soul of the, of the ego, you know, and, mm -hmm. and thinking is the voice of the, the conscious mind. But when we get to mm -hmm. the sort of the feeling side of us, the feeling is the, you know, the language of the subconscious mind and, and sensing is the language of the soul. So, when we sit in that feeling and sensing, well, then that in itself fires our imagination and our imagination is pretty much boundless, right? We can, we can sort of, we can bring back dead people. We can do, you know, connect to people regardless of geography, politics, anything else. We can create things whatever yeah. way, you know? Yeah. So um, I don't know. I, I really don't, and, yeah. but I, I do think it's, I'm, I'm fascinating what, what the body knows that we don't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and and you know, my work I've I've seen and witnessed things that there just is no rational explanation mm -hmm. for. So, for example, I was I had I, in one of my retreats, and it was a four day retreat. Um, there was this woman that was so stuck in her anger and her victimization about her ex, um, you know, who who wouldn't give her the final divorce and who was still holding on, and they she was feeling. Uh, weighed down by this house that she was living in that they both owned in paper but she was carrying all the weight of financially and he wouldn't do the paperwork that he, that they needed to do so that she could sell it and, and move into a smaller place and she was just like so so stuck in anger and so stuck in in poor me and when i spoke about the ego and i spoke about the importance of forgiveness for for our personal freedom she says oh no 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 i can't do that um i won't do that 
And so finally, I mean, we, we went deep into the process and we did multiple breathwork sessions. By the last breathwork session on Sunday night, she had this vision of herself of you know, sort of like floating above him. And she saw her ex underneath and she saw herself just kissing him on the forehead. Um, kind of, she was kind of like an angel figure kind of thing. But what it really symbolized was she had forgiven him. And I'm not exaggerating. I'm not making this up. On Monday, the guy signed the paperwork. A week later, the household. Like, how, do you, how do you explain that? I, I can't. Well, we resist persists, right? <laughs> yeah, that, that, that part makes sense. Hmm. But how, how are we interconnected in ways that science hasn't yet been able to explain? That he somehow felt her forgiveness and that was freeing. Yeah. It's, um, it is astounding. Yeah. What are you capable of, Christian? What am I capable of? What a question, Mighty P. You know, part of me wants to say I'm capable of doing anything that I want. And I don't, I don't think that's true. It's like, I'm not going to become a you know, a major league basketball player uh, or, you know, you know, uh, what do you call that? The, you know, win the Olympics in, in track and field or swimming or whatever. Um, but what I, I don't think that I've tapped my full potential yet um, in terms of numbers. Of, of people that I can impact. And, and so it, it, it comes back to my mission. And, and I try not to second guess it, right? Like I try not to measure it by, by numbers of people impacted because I could do a number myself. You know, if after 30 years of, of doing this work, I should have way more people on my email list or way more, more followers on social media. What, what am I doing wrong? I could easily do that trip, but I, I know better, right? And, and, how are we, how would would I be measuring? But maybe my job is to just impact one person or ten people that will then reach the numbers that I, that I'm that I feel inside me um, I'm meant to reach. So so kind of a both hand. Like I I don't feel like I've fulfilled my full potential, um, and I do have some some things inside of me that I know still are demanding expression, like like these next two books. Um, that are that are still brewing inside me. Um, I, I'm working on a, on a smaller, um, rather than a year long program, a, a five or six week program that will be uh, more accessible. Uh, that it will you know won't be as profoundly transformational as a whole year, um, but it will be enough to give people a, a, a different understanding about who they are, about the ego, about this relationship to power, so that at least they'll have that. Um, and, and so, yeah, so, so there, so I, what am I capable of? I'm capable of, of potentially capable of impacting, um, a large number of people in this world and making a real difference in their lives. What's, what's your superpower? Hmm. Man, you ask good questions. You, you, you've, you're asking stuff that nobody else has asked me in, in dozens of interviews that I've done. Um, my superpower. I think I would say I have a gift in cutting through the bullshit and going deep into another person's being or psyche or soul, whatever you want to call it and cutting through the crap and evoking their highest and best. And, and that comes from a, an, an ability to do some, to be really present. Like, so when I'm, when I'm with somebody, either one-on-one -on -one or with a group, I bring myself fully present. Um, and that's what makes, makes it possible for, for intuition and insights to happen and it's so i think that that ability to be to to be present is um is a superpower um deep level of compassion 
that comes from understanding myself and understanding the human condition um, and having been willing to to face myself and dive into my shadow um, and I think you know I've, it's a word that can that can confuse people but it's a, the depth of my surrender and, and my capacity to love I think those are my, my superpowers mm. you strong what's and what's a guilty pleasure for you then? Take the guilt out of it if you wish. <laughs> um, this last couple of years, Netflix has been a guilty pleasure. Um, it's, it, it, and some of it with intention, not all of it, but some of it with intention, like part of my plan I've, I've, I've been watching so many Netflix series in Spanish, like Spanish and Mexican and uh, Colombian um, with intention, like, like, like Spanish is my first language. And I'm in the process of translating this book, but discovered that I'm really missing a lot of vocabulary, because since I was 10, I've been doing all my reading and studies in, in, in English. So I, I don't have the ease of vocabulary. And in my day to day, it's not a problem because I can, you know, like we most of us end up doing Spanglish. If I can't think of a word, I throw in a word from the other language. But if I'm going to start teaching um, and doing podcast interviews in Spanish, I don't want to do that. I want to be able to express myself as fluently as I am, as I as I'm capable to in, in English. And so I'm actually doing these series. It, it is a guilty pleasure. Um, but I'm also doing it intentionally. Like if I'll, I'll pause on something and I'll, I'll Google it. How do they say that? And what does that mean exactly? Uh, so I'm, I'm using it as a way to expand my, my vocabulary. Yeah, and it's been a lot of fun and during the pandemic too. But if we were to, if we were to hack into your Netflix account, what, what would we find you watching? <laughs> um, right now I'm watching, what is it called? The Wheel of Times. Because I, I love, you know, the, all the stuff having to do with science fiction and magic and that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, all the, the mythical stuff, the Lord of the Rings, uh, Game of Thrones, all that kind of stuff I love. Um, I'm also watching Foundation. I finished the first, the first season of that. Um, and the Spanish one that I'm watching now, which is not great, this one. Had I known how many episodes it was before I got into it, I wouldn't have done it because it isn't that great. Um, but what is it called? It, um, what is it called? I can't think of it. Something about the flow. Oh, La Reina del Flow, the Queen of Flow, um, which I mean, it has, it, has, it, it has its guilty pleasure aspects. Of, you know, a lot of eye candy, um, a lot of, you know, it's about the, the reggaeton, the music scene in, in Colombia. But you know, the, it, it lacks a little bit of depth and quality of, of writing. I just discovered it has like 180 episodes. I was like, yikes, I don't think I can do this. Someone gave me a great tip once saying, if you find yourself semi-committed and then you're the type of person that really doesn't like to leave stuff unfinished, just watch the last yeah. episode. It's like the ultimate I mean, plot spoiler. You can watch the last episode. It's like, yeah, I'm kind of happy I saw the last one. I'm not watching the rest. You save yourself a mountain of time. So that's funny. Yeah, I, I think I may have to do that because I'm only like episode 18 or something. It's like, nope, I'm not doing 180 episodes of this. Yeah, it's uh, it's fun. It's just that way the brain goes. Yeah, yeah I saw the episode. It's like, okay, that's fine. We move on. But 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 you're right, and I'm glad you you said that because I am that kind of person that I I now that I started it. I want to finish it yeah. um, but it's a quite a commitment of time i don't think i'm gonna do that so i might just take you up on that and leap to the last episode what's the nicest thing someone could say about you hmm. i think it, i think it would it would be connected to your other question about my superpowers so somebody who sees that no, so, and, and, and I'm really fortunate or blessed that I, I get that feedback all the time um, from people in such a profound, heartfelt way uh, that see and acknowledge how my willingness you know, to spend time with them, to go deep into their own lives and their psyches with them made a whole huge difference in their lives. And, and so the, the, the depth of gratitude that I get is like, it, it's humbling. It's really humbling. 
So tell me, if you were to try and describe your fire in the belly in one or two words, Christian, what would they be? Hmm. Passion for transformation or passion for empowerment. Something along those, those lines. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Do you have a motto for next year? Mm. I don't. I don't. And, and I have a business coach who always um, recommends that, that you have one word that's your theme for next year. Um, I haven't come up with one yet, but I still have a few weeks to come up with one. Love it. Do you, do you, do you have a, a theme for next year? One actually we're talking about is I can and I will. You know, it's, I, I, will. I like that. It's just, um, it's good to, have, I think it is good to have a motto and a mantra, you know, but also another one I'd, I'd sort of looked at a while ago was just even just clearing the decks, just constantly clearing yeah. the decks and, because I do yeah. believe it is, it's not about doing more. It's just even if we un, un release the shadow within us, that yeah, itself yeah. will actually, you know, uh, because there's, there's an SAS saying, which I, I particularly like, you know, and they talk about slow is smooth and smooth is fast. And it is that thing mm -hmm. of just, you know, just because you're slowing down doesn't mean you're going, you know, you're going any slower, right? You know, because yeah, I, yeah. yeah you allow it to be more purposeful you allow yourself to decide what you want and you decide that you're going to do it full stop yeah so. yeah i love that you know you're saying you're you're speaking kind of gave me an insight into what it might be for me um which i've been very mission driven like putting the mission above my own um pleasure or preferences for probably for probably 30 years and I think what it like, and I've been, and I've gotten much better about, you know, and, and I'm not complaining. Like I have a really amazing life and with incredible um, people and experiences in it. So I'm, I'm not complaining at all. Uh, but I think the theme for next year is weaving into the mission, what I want. Um, so, so for example, um, I had to, you know, not gonna bother you with the details, but I had to move out of this place that I was renting in Miami, this beautiful house that I was renting in Miami for the last 10 years. And, and it was kind of a dramatic way, which I knew was, was not an accident. I didn't feel victimized by it. And I knew that I was actually being served by being freed mm -hmm. uh, because now that I'm doing everything virtually, I can be wherever I want. So traditionally I would have said, all right, powers that be, where, where should I go next? And what I'm doing now is like, all right, yes, if, if there's a preference, I want to know, but also what do I want? Where do I want to be? So that's one of the ways in which I've, I'm kind of in a nomadic life right now. I'm in, in Quito, Ecuador for a few months, for a couple of months, and then we'll see. We'll see what, where, where I land after this. All I need is good Wi-Fi these days. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, it's a story of life, isn't it? All I need is a good connection. <laughs> You know, connect, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. Connection to what? Define what you're connecting to. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, connecting to that's self. A, that is, that is so profound. And and they did a study a couple of years ago, as I'm sure you know, that at the root of addiction is is that longing for connection. That that's what we're really longing for. I love it with some guests. I would often ask, you know, what's their core values or their soul values? You know, and core quite often will be integrity honesty trust whatever but actually I, I love when it's redefined and i can only say for me when it comes to actually soul values because the core values are quite often driven by a prior, a prior lack so mm. i value integrity because there's been a time that, that there hasn't been mm. you know which is fine you kind of go well that's great but it has connotations right but when you get to soul value, I mean, for me, it is love, connection and service. And it's interesting mm. to talk about that connection, you know, and, and to be of service and to be of love. It's like, it, to me, it has no negative backstory. It just is, you know, and so when I we're connecting, that. we just are. It's beautiful, right? 
I love that. That is so profound. So simple and profound. Love, connection, and service. Yeah, um, I'll sign up to that. Yeah, you know, so yeah. it's, um, it's awesome. Christian, remind yeah. people, where can they get a hold of your book? Where can they hunt you down, track you down, stalk you, any of the above? Yeah, well, thank you so much for, for that question. And, and thank you for having me on the show. Um, it's been an amazing conversation. I've, out of the dozens of interviews, this, this one uh, takes the cake in terms of the depth of, of the questions and, and, and the breadth of it. And I love the, the back and forth and the, the ease of it, the natural conversational part of it. Um, so thank you. And thank you for having the show to begin with, period. Uh, in your willingness to do that, um, I know that many, many lives are, are touched and impacted. Uh, so in terms of where to find the book, um, wherever books are sold, you, know, you can order at your, at your local bookstore, um, your local Waterstones or whatever, whatever it is, or um, on Amazon. Mm -hmm. And in terms of reaching me, uh, probably the best way is my website, which is soulfulpower.com. Um, and from there, they can access my social media. We can connect that way to go back to that connection word. Um, and for your audience, um, if, if they will go to soulfulpower.com and sign up for my email list, and we know that it just takes one click to unsubscribe at any point if it doesn't work for you. But for anybody doing that, we'll send them a copy of um, a, chap a sample chapter from the book. And it's a chapter that talks about what it means to live heroically in the 21st century, which you and I have delved into um, parts of it. Uh, we'll send them some of the power practices that we were talking about. Um, and we'll send them a recorded teaching and guided meditation that I created last year on trust with the intention of helping us navigate these chaotic, uncertain times that are just rift with uh, fear. Um, and so how do we move more into trust in these times? And, and so, again, thank you. Amazing offer. Thank you. Any sense of when we're likely to see the, the, the two other books in this trilogy? Yeah, I'm, I'm working on the Spanish translation, and I would say I'm probably you know, half, halfway through that. So that's next. I'm probably halfway, maybe a little bit more in the, the next one, which is on relationships. So it'll be done next year. I don't know when, not first quarter, maybe second quarter. Um, and then probably the third book, which is about purpose and conscious leadership, probably a year and a half after that, maybe two years after that. Great fun. Lots of exciting things ahead then. Yeah, yeah. Christian, listen, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for just being here. And uh, you know, just to remind people, Awakening, the Soul of Power is out now. It's available on Amazon, all good bookstores. And you know, feel free also to go and pick up the, the wonderful offer that Christian's put out there on the, on the website, which we'll put in the show notes for people after the show as well. So Christian, I thank you for you. I thank you for your presence and being here. And uh, until the next time. Yeah, thank you, Mighty P. It's been a, it's been a wonderful experience. Thank you. Thank you.